you're in trouble today. There's an illustration, and uh, so seatbelts on. Here we go. Let's open our Bibles. We're going to go straight into it, into 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Click on your Bible. It will be on the screen behind me, um, or you can turn there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the f- first nine verses um, of this chapter here. It says this, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by faith, Uh, Sorry, as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it yet. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? For uh, are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? The message translation of the Greek there says, are you not being infantile? You're being like small children. What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes sins grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are God's co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. As we carry on this series, uh, There Is a Better Way, uh, we're going to look today about the better way of maturity. The better way of maturity. Paul's letter to the Corinthian church is all about the issues that are going on, and Ian has unpacked that over these last couple of weeks. And he begins moving in this letter to them to speak about their conduct and how they're living as immature Christians. They're living in immaturity, and he's saying to them, listen, there's a better way of maturity. There's a better way for you to live, and it is the way of maturity. In other words, Paul is saying to them, it's time to grow up. And I wonder through the love of God and through the grace that hopefully I'll speak with, God would challenge you through the words I say today to grow up in some of the areas of your life. And this is why we need to know our identity in Christ, that we're children of God, we're secure in his love, so that we can take the challenge from him that says, listen, it's time to grow up. And this table here is going to help us today to illustrate uh, this to us. I want you to imagine that this table is everything in your life, your spiritual life, your family life, your work life, your church life, whatever area that you can think of, the table is your life and what happens in your life is what is served on the table to you. So I hope you've got that image. Uh, so hey, you may be, uh, take for example, the, the, uh, the health of you, of your health, and currently is being served some challenges to you, say your work life, and currently what's being served on the table might be a good job, a job you don't enjoy, a, a job that pays well, doesn't pay well, whatever. Uh, this, the table is what's being served to you in your life, but the crucial question is uh, for us today that we're going to consider is what chair are we sitting in at the table? Because there are two chairs here today. There's a chair of immaturity and there's a chair of maturity. And I want to challenge us and ask us of what is being served to us on the table, what chair are we choosing to sit in? What choice are we making? Because Paul in this scripture here, he contrasts a chair of immaturity and a chair of maturity. See, the Corinthian church were living as infants, as children, and they were taking the chair of immaturity of what was being served in the church and what was taking place in the Corinth church at the time. And Paul is calling them forward and saying to them, it's time to come and sit at the chair of maturity. And you see, these chairs are fine if you are meant to be in the chair. If you're a new Christian or you're new, fa- new to faith, you should be sitting in the chair of immaturity. You're on a journey towards maturity. But the thing is, is that immaturity is a season. And so many of us make it a lifestyle and a pattern that we hold with us for too long. See, Paul says to them, you should by now be on solid food. You should have moved on from the milk that I'm having to give you uh, because they, they had not moved on from this because immaturity is a season. But hey, if you're in that season of discovering faith of, and you're new to this whole thing of following Jesus, this chair is very appropriate for you. 
It's appropriate for a child to sit in a high chair, but for so many of us, we are squeezing ourselves into the chair of immaturity, and God is saying to us, there is a better way, a better chair for us to sit in at the table. It is the chair of maturity. And I don't know about you, but I found, even as I've been preparing this, I've been, uh, God is so enlightened in my life, the amount of times that, uh, actually, I would say, uh, you know, hopefully a lot of the time I'm sitting on the chair of maturity, but sometimes things are served on the table, that means I switch seats. Because we often flip backwards and forwards here. So in church, I can look very mature, and I sit at the seat of maturity, and you all uh, may look at me and think, wow, what a mature person he is, sitting so well at the seat of maturity. But then me and my wife begin to have some uh, challenging conversations, and it's amazing how quickly I can squeeze myself into the chair of immaturity. When my children begin to serve some um, peculiar behavior on the table and some challenging behavior, it's amazing how I can take myself from the chair of maturity and squeeze myself in the chair of immaturity and react to the behavior that they present to me on the table. Has anyone else realized that in our lives? That sometimes things come to us on the table and we decide which chair we're going to sit in, the chair of immaturity or the chair of maturity. And we're going to have a window into my blissful family familial home uh, because I have two young children. You know that. I have a a daughter, Maggie, who is one year old and very much belongs in the chair of immaturity. And then I have a a child, Phoebe, who is three years old, who is gently and slowly making the transition into the chair of maturity. And there's some things that I've observed um, from their behavior that is going to help illustrate what this transition from the chair of immaturity into the better way of maturity, uh, what that looks like. See, my kids are great, but the issue is with them, they are very immature. I don't know whether your kids are like it or whether it's just my kids. Love them to pieces, but they have one major issue, and it is immaturity. And I find myself saying over and over, come on, you need to grow up. In fact, that's our whole uh, purpose as parents, is to mature our children, is to ready them to be independent, functioning, living adults in the world, isn't it? It's our journey to mature them, and so it is with our Heavenly Father. He is on a mission to mature us and to grow us so that we're ready for what he has ahead of us. But the trouble is, is so many of us don't uh, submit ourselves to his parenting and him bringing us on into maturity and we choose to make the chair of immaturity a lifestyle and so we are not ready for everything that he wants to do through us and in us uh, in our lives. And so we're going to ask ourselves a question, how do we move to the better way of maturity? How do we move along this better way? The first thing that will help us on this journey is to realize there's a bigger picture. Realize there's a bigger picture. We're actually covering two chapters here of the letter. And so we're just going to jump in and out and and it's going to help us understand some of these principles that Paul is giving to the Corinthian church in understanding the better way um, of maturity. And the first thing that he says to them is to understand that there's a bigger picture. We read it in those verses there, verses 6 and 7. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. See, in their immaturity, the Corinthian church were obsessed with the human leaders that had been put in place. They were arguing over over, you know, Ian said it last week, they were arguing over who's better, Paul or, or, or Apollos. And uh, what, what Paul says to them is, he, it's not about us, it's about what God is doing. There is a bigger picture, a grand plan that's being worked out. We each play our part, but God is doing something here. There is a bigger picture for them to understand. And so it is always in our lives. What is served on the table, There is always a bigger picture behind what is served there for us. God is always at work doing something greater, doing outworking a grander plan for us. And so it may be that the what we get served at the table doesn't fit our preference. There's issues with this chair here. Because Maggie, if she is served what she doesn't like, she will chuck the 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 plate onto the floor. You know this? Yeah, so uh, nearly every day, and for Leanne, probably three times a day, she's underneath this chair cleaning up the mess because Maggie would not take what had been served from her. The chair of immaturity has very limited preferences. They don't like a lot of different things. You know, the flavors have to be simple. You put more than three flavors on this plate here, and you're in trouble. 
you put them a, a bit too complex, some uh, sauce and some spice in there, we're in trouble in that chair. Very simple palate. And so it is sometimes in our immaturity, when it seems like things are put on the table that we don't want there, and we don't want that to happen in our lives, we react. Because what happens when, the, when we breach the rules of serving a simple meal to that child is that uh, what happens is it's my way or the highway. And uh, emotions rule the day, and uh, everything is chucked off the table, the text is sent, the the word is spoken out of point, I'm leaving this church, I'm not coming back here, I'm not speaking to you anymore, whatever it is for us, we react with immaturity because of what is served at the table. But you and I understand that as adults that sit at the seat of maturity, you and I understand that actually there are a broad range of flavors to understand and to appreciate. And even though we might not like that particular food, we'll take that food because we understand one day we might like it. Our our palate is broadened. Our our preference for things is broadened. We realize there's other people at the table and it would not be appropriate for us to chuck our food off of the table like the chair of immaturity does. And here's one of the key a litmus test for us in our maturity is do our emotions rule us or do we rule our emotions? It's a key litmus test for us. If you find yourself, if that person doesn't speak to me or if that goes wrong or if my car breaks down and suddenly you get overwhelmed with your emotions and they rise up, let me tell you, take a journey to the better way of maturity. You rule your emotions. Your soul is ruled by you. You do not have to live a life that is ruled by your emotions and by the seat of your soul uh, because uh, the Spirit will help us to overcome and we make decisions that here, my, my emotions are raging about this, but I make the decision to sit in the chair of maturity and to take what has been served on the table. We've got to understand the sovereign will of God here. Because in his sovereign will, sometimes he is serving things at the table that are not very nice. How many of you know, I I would love to sit at my table and eat Domino's pizza every single day in my life. In fact, when calories and and all of that don't count in heaven, I'm going to eat Domino's pizza every single day of my life. I'll see you there. Uh, But I would love to have Domino's pizza every day served at my table. But the seat of maturity understands that we need a broad range in our diet, that sometimes we have have to serve some not very nice things at the table uh, because there is a grander plan that needs to be worked out. We need to eat our vegetables and we need to eat the different varied diets. I know nothing about nutrition, so I'm going to end it there. But we need lots of different things in our plate to help us grow into maturity. And so it is with God sometimes because sometimes God will serve to us some challenges. Sometimes God will serve to us some trials. And it tastes like Brussels sprouts, and it tastes like broccoli, and it tastes like celery, and we want to eat butter, and we want to eat carbs, and we want to eat fat, but it is not good for us. See, we are feeding our immature children vegetables because we want them to be healthy and ready for the season that's ahead of them, that they will grow into healthy uh, people as they grow forward. And, And so it is with the sovereign will of God. Sometimes he serves things to us that are to help us in the future. They don't feel very good right now, but if we choose to sit in the seat of maturity and work through what is being presented to us, God will bring us to a far better place than we were uh, before. So whether it be in your relationships, your church life, your workplace, uh, whatever it is, we need to ask ourselves, what is the bigger picture being played out? If you're making notes, you can put down there James 1, verses 2 and to 4. You know, James talks there about uh, the suffering that we face, the, the trials that come our way. And he says to them, if you endure trials, if you eat the green vegetables, if you suck it up and eat what's served at the table, then you will develop perseverance. And when perseverance finishes its work, you will be mature, not lacking anything. We have to endure with perseverance what is served to us at the table, and that is what it means to sit at the seat of maturity, that we understand this bigger picture that's being played out. The second thing that we see in these couple of chapters, Paul highlighting to this church, this second thing is that we need to remind ourselves of the privilege. Remind ourselves of the privilege. See, sitting at the seat of maturity doesn't only take perspective, it also takes gratitude. Gratitude. 
Paul writes to them, and it's in the message version on the screen behind me, 1 Corinthians 3, 21 to 23. It says, I do not want to hear any of you bragging about yourself or anyone else. This is the immaturity that was being on display. They were bragging in themselves and other people. Everything is already yours as a gift. Paul, Apollos, Peter, the world, life, death, the present, the future, all of it is yours. And you are privileged to be in union with Christ, who is in union with God. What is Paul saying to them here? Is that they were fighting over human leaders, over who was better, over uh, what, was, what they, they had on their table. But actually, Paul was reminding them, everything has been given to you. Everything. You have the privilege of having everything in God. And they were focusing on what had, uh, they were focusing on the gift and not the giver. They were focusing on the blessings and not the blesser. They'd missed the gratitude. They got consumed with what they had been given, these human leaders and their own importance, and they'd forgotten about the one who made it all happen. And they'd lost their gratitude. And it meant that they began sitting in the seat of immaturity. What do we say to our kids? Even before my kids could understand what I was saying to them, I began saying to them, don't you know that there's children starving in the world and here you are not eating your dinner, right? We do that to our kids. And we think, oh no, I sound just like my own parents. But we can't help but do it because we're trying to bring some gratitude into their lives to realize here not every child gets to sit at the table and eat the quality of food that you get to eat. Not every child gets to sit in a high chair and have a table like you have. We try and bring some perspective that brings gratitude out in their lives. And so sometimes we need that in our lives. We need to remind ourselves of what we've been given, of the privilege of the life that we have. That we don't look at other people's plates and desire what they have and go after what, they, what we think should be ours. But we understand that what I have, I have been blessed with. And I have some privileges that other people don't have. And so I'm going to take with gratitude and realize the privilege that I have um, to eat at this table. Because we need to understand that gratitude is essential for maturity. When you start feeling like you want to chuck a relationship off of the table, or when you start saying about this church, I don't like how this is going, I want to chuck this off of the table. Or your, your work life and your boss is giving you grief and suddenly you want to just chuck your food off of the table and what's being presented and leave and, and be done with it. We need to remind ourselves of everything that we have been blessed with. We start thinking about the people that haven't got a job right now. We start thinking about the churches that don't have all the blessings that we have in this church. We start thinking about that relationship and all the blessings that it does bring to us. And we focus, this isn't positive thinking, this isn't psychological kind of um, ways of thinking, but actually this is the word of God that we count our blessings and we realize the privilege that we have to live as we do. That all of the, all of the promises uh, of God are yes and amen to us in Christ Jesus. What an incredible truth for us to live by. And we live with that gratitude. But the thing about this seat of immaturity is this seat, we need to cut up and prepare the food. We go from those stages, don't we? We start by liquidizing the food. We start by then giving a bit more solid food. Then we begin giving solid food, but it needs cutting up. But thankfully, thank the Lord that Phoebe has now grown to that stage where we can serve her a meal and she is becoming a self-feeder. She can uh, handle the food, she can break it up, and she feeds it to herself. It is wonderful. I cannot wait till all of my children are done, and the chair of immaturity is out of my house. And I can't wait for us in the life of the church when all of us can move on from the chair of immaturity, and we can be done with this seat, and we can make room for the people that should be in these seats, not us. But here we go. Uh, but this seat here is a self-feeding seat. If you come to church because you're desperate to be fed, it's a great attitude to have, but you cannot make that a lifestyle. I can't remember really the last time that I came into church thinking, I really, really need this word. Of course, we always need the word of God, but I've developed a pattern in my life where I'm self-feeding myself right? So I come into church and I realize this is going to help me. This is going to build me up. This is going to challenge me. This is going to help me understand the word. But uh, you know, we're not supposed to eat once a week or twice a week in connect group and Sundays. We're supposed to eat every single day of our lives. And I want to encourage you today to develop some kind of devotional life uh, in your weekly, daily habit. 
Your devotional life is oxygen for your Christian life. If you are not getting time every single day, even if it's one or two minutes, if you are not making time, then you are starving yourself of spiritual oxygen. And you will have an unhealthy spiritual life. So I, I can't do enough to implore you, to beg you. I don't want to guilt you into it, but I want to inspire you and say to you, there is a better way. And if you can make time for God every single day, because we have to remind ourselves of the privilege that we have. And when daily and in the morning, I would say try and do it in the morning, but if you do it at night, uh, then that's fine. Do it whenever you can. But if every, every single morning, I remind myself that I am a son of God that I've been saved by grace, that Jesus died on a cross for me, that I am living and breathing not normal life but eternal life, that the Spirit who raised Christ from the dead is living inside of me, that the Lord is my shepherd and He's going to provide for me and He's going to guide me and He's the banner over my life and He's going to make a way for me. And I remind myself every single morning of all of these things, all that God, all of those promises in your word are yes and amen for me. And I take the time every single day to remind myself of the privilege that I have to live in and it produces gratitude in my life so when when somebody serves something disgusting on the table I've already reminded myself there is a privilege to sit at this table and so I'm not going to sit at this seat of immaturity I'm going to sit at this seat of maturity because of what I have in Christ and who I am in him we remind ourselves of the privilege but there is another thing that Paul goes on to remind them, and it's crucial in our, in our walking in the better way of maturity. And that is for us to resemble our parents. Resemble our parents. Because maturity requires guidance. Maturity requires guidance. In chapter 4, verses 14 to 16, uh, he says, I'm writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. When Leanne's not around and I'm looking after the kids, often I do away with the table. And uh, sorry, Leanne, uh, she knows that I do this. And I put a mat down on the living room floor, this big mat, and I just scatter the food on the floor and I let my children eat off of the mat. I know, it's absolutely terrible. But the stress of this table sometimes with two young children is just too much to bear. And it's far easier to let them eat like feral children like they want to uh, off of the floor. But when Leanne is there, she's very, very good and she's very disciplined. And more often than not, we sit on the opposite side to our children and we eat with our children. In fact, the, the table is a crucial element of a family life, isn't it, that we sit around the table? Why do we sit with our children where we could wait two more hours and it would be far more pleasurable and, and nicer experience to eat away from them? Why do we do that? Because we are modeling to them. Modeling to them the way that we behave at the table. Modeling to them how it is to act in maturity. And we need it in our lives. In our Christian lives, we need to find models that will show us the way. See, Paul says to them, you have many guardians in Christ. And the word he used there was a word to describe um, a, a rich young child. A, a rich child would be escorted by guardians. So the parents wouldn't take the child to school and into the town and to their classes wherever they went, but they would have a guardian that accompanied them and protected them and uh, had laughs with them and made them feel good. It was somebody that was mature, but their, jo their job wasn't to mature the child. And what he was saying to them is, in our Christian life, so often we surround ourselves with guardians, with people that have got our backs, people that hold us accountable, but they're people that ultimately are alongside us and make us feel good. And this is essential for us to grow in maturity. We need community. You can't grow in maturity alone. And we need good people around us. And by the way, we need to be careful of who we choose to sit around our lives. Because if you sit in it too close, Maggie, you're going to get covered in food. And some of us sit too close to immature people. And we get covered in their mess because we don't sit around mature people. And so it's important who we're around. But what he was saying to them is you don't need guardians. You need fathers. You need people that will discipline us. Uh, you need people that will prepare you, somebody who will help you to, and show you the way to be mature. Ever since I became a Christian, I've always had at least one person who I've been looking up to and modeling my life on. 
And yes, you know, as we said, some people like to say, oh, I just follow Jesus. But we need people around us that we can imitate and we can model our lives on. And I want to encourage you to find some people that you can model yourself on. Find some people that will guide you in the way of maturity. See, I, forever people have said there's not enough fathers, there's not enough mothers in the life of the church. But I would flip that. I reckon that actually there are enough people further on the journey, but so often we have a submission issue. And we think that, particularly us millennials, we think that nobody can teach us anything, that we can't learn off of a podcast or off of YouTube. We think we know all the answers, but we've got to submit ourselves to people. And it may be that you formalize a relationship, but maybe, you know, so often for me, it's never been a formal, would you please be my mentor? Would you please help me? But actually, I've just observed people. And I've looked at them and thought, I can model myself on that. I love how they do that. And we submit ourselves and we imitate what is being displayed to us in maturity at the table. Because why is this? Because when we, when we get a, an illustration of what maturity is, it helps call us forward. It helps pull us to a greater destination. So often we make Christianity about what we shouldn't be doing. We shouldn't chuck our food on the floor. We shouldn't stand up in the high chair. We shouldn't have a tantrum. We shouldn't say this. We shouldn't do that. But actually... If there's a model of maturity, it calls us forward and it displays what we should be doing. That actually, not only do we not do that, but there's a better way for you to behave. There's a better way for you to call forward. And so if you're struggling with some issues in your life, let me encourage you, get some models around you that will uh, help call you forward and guide you. So I wonder today what chair you're in, the chair of immaturity or the chair of maturity. I wonder how you're doing with realizing that there's a bigger picture with reminding yourself of the privilege that you have to sit at the table, or whether you've got those parents that you're resembling and, and who you're putting yourself under and who are growing you into maturity. However, just as we close today, what Paul is saying to them here is something far greater about maturity. And this is the punchline to these couple of chapters, because what he's saying is even more than sitting in the seat of maturity, there is a far better way, because actually maturity doesn't require a seat at the table. Maturity doesn't sit at the table. Why? Because maturity serves at the table. Maturity serves at the table. And all the way through these two scriptures, Paul talks over and over about servanthood, serving, servanthood, serving. In fact, he uses a unique word that he only uses here in all of his letters, and it is the word of a steward. And we don't have time to go into the detail about this word, but what he says to them, what a steward did was they were still a servant of the master, but they would make available the master's resources for the other servants. They would pay the servants and deal with their annual leave and deal with their family issues. They were the one who stewarded what had been given on the table and distributed it. See, Here's the issue. In our family, the most important role is often Leanne, the mother of our household, because she's the one who buys the food, prepares the food, cuts up the food, serves the food, cleans up after the food. She is serving at the table. And without somebody who was mature enough to serve at the table and manage all of the behavior and make sure dad isn't chucking the food on the floor for them to eat off of, as long as that role is there, everything goes well at the table. But the trouble is, is that too many of us, and I do it as well, we think, I'm not in this chair anymore. I have now sat at the seat of maturity. And we think maturity is an ornament to be looked at, not an apron to be worn to serve people. And we think, look at me, I'm so mature, I've got my devotional life sorted, God's blessed me with this, I'm honoring him in this way and that way, and we sit at the table, but all the time that we sit at the table and we want people to look at us, we're taking up room for somebody else to come and sit at the table. And here's the big why, why we need to grow in maturity, because if we would get up and we would serve at the table, we make room for more people to come and sit at the table. And this is why we have teams and this is why we encourage you to serve. It's not so that we can fill a rotor and fill positions. It's because it's crucial in your understanding of maturity and your growing in maturity. And the more of us that serve at the table, the more seats that we can make available for people to come and sit at the table. The more ministries that we have to outreach and to love people and to show them the love of God, the more room that we make for people to come and sit at the table. And this is what Paul was saying to them. You're consumed with yourselves consumed with things that you should have moved on by, consumed with how good you think you are, and actually there's a city to reach, and there's people that need to know the truth, and who need to come and sit at the table of salvation. And so he's saying, grow up, come and serve at the table, don't sit at the table. 
And so I wonder what areas in your life that you know far too often I find myself in the seat of immaturity. Think about it in your marriage. Maybe when you get in those arguments with your spouse, you're constantly sitting in the seat of immaturity. I wonder if we could progress on there and begin realizing, you know, there's a bigger picture to what my spouse is going through. I'm so blessed to have that person in my life, that God provided that person to me. They were a gift to me. And we get that perspective of gratitude. And then we begin asking people, your marriage looks really healthy. What do you do? How do you handle it when you're in an argument? Could you help me? We're facing some challenges and we, we bring ourselves under submission to somebody and we ask them to help us. But then wouldn't it be great that not only we just stayed there, but we said, how can I serve my spouse? How can I serve them? You see how you'll move from this place of immaturity to a place of health. And you create room and blessing and abundance in your marriage if you take that place of serving. We could keep going on and on, illustrating this. Your workplace, your family, church life. What if we all served and we didn't take a seat at the table, but we served at the table? But for some of us today, you've never come to the table. And we want to give you an invitation today to come and sit at the table. You realizing that God is playing out a bigger picture in your life. You realize that there's more to life than this. That you've been eating some scraps at the side of the table trying to figure out life. But I want to say to you today, there's a better way and it's to follow Jesus Christ. And he has an incredible life of blessings served at a table. And all you need to do is come and take a seat today. Some of you have left this table because you don't think you're qualified to sit at this table. You think you've gone too far, you've walked away from God and you've left the table, but we want to invite you today to come and sit at the table once again. And so we're going to bow our heads, close our eyes. For the rest of us, I wonder what areas there are in our lives that we know we're sitting in the seat of immaturity far too often. I want you just to think of it in your mind and we're going to pray for the Holy Spirit's help to move us on to the better way of maturity. Just think of it right in your mind, whatever that area is. Whatever that moment is, when it gets served on the table, you go to immaturity. Holy Spirit, help us. Help us to walk in the way of maturity. Help us not be consumed with ourselves, consumed with our own issues, consumed with what we want, consumed with how good we are. Lord, but help us always to take the position of a servant. To model what you showed to us, Jesus, that you came to serve And help us to be servants at the table. Not those that sit at the table looking important. Not those that sit at the table and make a mess. But those that serve and make room for other people. Help us to choose the better way of maturity, we pray. In your name, amen.